Hello, everybody, and welcome to another VBS Tech Conference session. Today, we're going to focus on terrain. Uh, with me is Earl. Earl is the technical director at TerraSim. He's going to be doing most of the talking today. Uh, TerraSim is a wholly owned BISIM subsidiary. They're based in Pittsburgh, and they've done a lot of fantastic terrain work over the years. There's a, they uh, developed TerraTools, uh, which is a very powerful product. We're going to talk a bit about that today uh, during this, this brief. Um, so I, my name is Pete Morrison. Uh, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Bohemia Interactive Simulations. Uh, if you didn't uh, see it, we have a, uh, three other videos already on YouTube for the tech conference uh, presentation that we did over a month ago now, uh, looking at VBS4. And we also spoke about the VBS World Server during that brief. I'll be posting a link to that in the chat shortly. You can check that out if you haven't seen it already. And this is very much a continuation from those previous briefs. Uh, today, we're going to focus on terrain. Uh, we're going to look at the products and technologies that we have today and also in the near future to make it sort of quick and easy for you to build, uh, stream and edit terrain and solve the terrain problem, which Earl will also talk about uh, in a minute. So VBS4, it's almost ready for release. The release date for VBS4 20.1 is August the 17th. Uh, that's a ready for training release. We'll fully replace VBS3 and we'll also ship with a version of the VBS World Server that Earl will talk about. Uh, lots of exciting things are happening right now within Bohemia. Uh, we're back on US Army ST, working on the CSC, the Common Synthetic, Synthetic Environment with our partner, Mark. Uh, and that's going, going very well. And in fact, uh, some of the technologies you're going to see here will probably make their way into US Army ST in due course. Uh, specifically the One World Terrain element. Uh, okay, so the system here that we have is called Demio. You can ask questions in the chat box on the right. Those questions are private between you and our moderators. We will flag your questions and we'll try and get to them at the end. If we don't answer your question, we will follow up with you directly via email uh, as soon as we can. We're also recording the entire session. We're gonna upload the entire session to YouTube, hopefully before the day is over. Uh, and so today we're going to focus on uh, the world server, kind of at the high level. We're going to have a look at the data that resides on the world server, the base terrain data. Uh, we're going to have a look at that in VBS4 specifically. And then tomorrow it's more of a deep dive. Tomorrow we'll be doing a deep dive and we've also got some partners, I think Rikon and Lux Carter coming in to present some of their data loaded into the world server as well. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Earl to present the first few slides. I'm going to come back in a few minutes and talk about products. Over to you, Earl. All right. Uh, thanks, Pete. <clears throat> so uh, just a quick agenda for, for today. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, about BISM's world server technology and uh, the various pieces of that. Um, so, so initially, we're going to look at some of the common challenges for, for building terrain for simulation. Um, we're then going to actually take a look at some of the, the current uh, BSM terrain products uh, and where we're going with those products as part of explaining uh, what our BSM world server technology is and, and why we've built it. Um, we're going to show how procedural generation can help make uh, complex and detailed scenes for uh, your, your simulation systems using sparse input data. Um, and then we're going to demonstrate a range of terrain examples around the globe and, and explain how those tie back to these, uh, these topics. Um, okay, so the the challenges of, of building terrain for simulation uh, are many. Uh, so, so starting with getting good source data for terrain isn't always uh, easy, uh, and if it is easy, it's probably not cheap. Um, building high fidelity fidelity terrain often requires information that's not part of source data, even when it is high quality. So, uh, things like uh, road markings or um, uh, traffic lights and you know garbage cans and all the things that make a, a scene really look real uh, often aren't present and they have to be created somehow. Um, supporting a range of use cases from a, a single terrain project can be a challenge if you're trying to support um, uh, a cockpit simulation for uh, an aircraft that needs to run at a very high frame rate frame rate for a, a VR system. Uh, at the same time as wanting to use that terrain for trainees that are on the ground that need to have uh, interactions with buildings, opening doors and, and moving inside buildings, uh, that can be very challenging to support. And um, if, you're, if your simulation system uses multiple runtimes connected together, it can be uh, costly and difficult to, um, to manage multiple runtime exports. So, so building terrains for multiple systems, uh, especially if that requires uh, multiple tools. Um, 
And in the case of having to use uh, specialized tools, that means you need specialized staff and training, uh, and that can be difficult uh, on a limited budget. And finally, um, once trains are built and you're uh, providing them down to the to the point of need to the users that need those trains, um, it can be difficult to manage that over time if there's uh, changes to the trains and people are receiving different versions of trains or someone's made a, an edit somewhere. Um, it can be just uh, difficult and a lot of a lot of overhead to do that. Um, so now I'm going to pass it back to Pete. He's going to uh, cover uh, BISM's terrain products. Yeah, so uh, we want to just talk at the high level about the products and technologies we have today uh, and what we're building for the near future. So uh, today we have uh, a new terrain editing tool in the form of VBS Geo, and that's part of VBS 4. Uh, I presented it during the tech conference recently. Earl is going to show it again today. Uh, this is a really easy to use, what you see is what you get terrain editing tool. Uh, it's available to any VBS4 administrator. You can go in and you can modify the terrain, add new buildings, add roads, uh, delete buildings that might be in the base terrain layer. And that saves your terrain changes as part of a battle space in VBS4 in the geo package format. Uh, so VBS Geo, um, really cool, easy to use tool. And then we have the VBS World Server. Now it's a product, uh, it is encapsulating the World Server technology that Earl is gonna be talking about in great detail uh, very, very soon. And it streams terrain data down to VBS4 and VBS Blue IG, as well as storing battle, space, battle spaces um, for VBS4. So the VBS World Server is a productized version of the World Server tech that we ship with VBS4. Uh, we then have TerraTools. This is a very powerful terrain editing tool. It's designed for uh, advanced users. You can really modify how procedural terrain generation happens. You can do really large area terrains uh, and you can build terrains that appear as insets on the world server. Uh, and so, so the difference between VBS Geo, which is a terrain editing tool, easy to use, uh, what you see is what you get, and Terra Tools, advanced users, large area terrain, is very important to understand. And if you're thinking about building terrain for VBS or for the world server, we can advise you on what tools you need based upon your experience level and really what you're trying to do with your terrain. We do expect the majority of VBS users will be perfectly happy with VBS Geo. You can import uh, various terrain formats, satellite data, for example, new roads, as well as edit uh, areas directly within within VBS. So um, very important distinction to understand. So Earl's going to talk about the world server technology. Um, we've wrapped it up into the VBS world server, which is a product you install uh, alongside VBS4. And then we have this idea of a customized world server or an enterprise world server. Uh, and this is very much aimed at an organization uh, large or small that needs to centralize their terrain data, they need to manage that terrain data, import various data formats and export correlated terrain to, to different runtime engines, or even connect at runtime and pull down terrain data at runtime. Uh, so we can take the world server technology that we're going to talk about today and we can kind of make it work for your specific needs. Uh, we're already doing this for a, a couple of countries. We're more than happy to talk in detail about that separately uh, about what that uh, about what that means. Uh, and then Earl, if you could just click one more forward, please. It's worthwhile just talking briefly about what we're doing in the near future. So uh, in, this is in the next year or two. Uh, we are moving more and more TerraTools components into this world server framework. And so we are really building the next TerraTools. Uh, in a, in a cloud enabled way. Uh, and, and so the TerraTools is going to merge slowly into this, this new thing, this cloud enabled, world server enabled TerraTools. Uh, we're already working on that. It will include, for example, a user interface redesign to make it as easy to use as possible. But you can definitely see a future where TerraTools is running in a browser, connected to the world server uh, in the cloud, and you're working completely online. Uh, we're continuing to work on this customized or enterprise world server model uh, with additional runtimes and features. Earl will talk, for example, about our support for Unreal and Unity. Uh, and finally, we're building a terrain SDK, which will allow you to connect your own applications directly to the world server to pull down terrain or make terrain queries uh, as well. So uh, that's our, our terrain related products in a nutshell. Uh, I appreciate it's kind of complex, 
Uh, and what we're going to look at really for the rest of the brief is the world server technology, online capability to stream terrain data in different formats and store your terrain data. Okay, Earl, so back to you. Okay, thanks, Pete. Um, so what is BSM's world server technology? I think uh, Pete's given an over here, overview here already. Um, but it's worth just taking a look back at, at VBS3 and how um, it's inherited its uh, terrain system going back to the, the, its origins as a, as a, as a video game. Um, that imposed some limitations on how VBS3 terrain could be uh, created. Uh, and with VBS4, uh, BSM had the chance to really reinvent how, how to think about uh, terrain. Uh, and so the, the, the world server is a result of that. It's, it's a, a separation of the runtime from the terrain generation process and the terrain serving process. Um, so I'm just going to explain a little bit about that here. Uh, so first of all, um, what we're calling world server technology encompasses everything that uh, Pete has talked about. So the VBS world server is a product built on this, the customized world servers uh, that we can offer to customers to do uh, you know, specialized applications is based on this technology. So it's a capability and not a product. Um, it includes a central repository for global simulation data. We're always gathering more data, curating it, and, and collecting it to get together on this, this global data set that can be used to build, uh, as we've used for VBS4, to build the entire planet. Um, it offers open API access to data. So that includes uh, OGC web protocols, um, WMS as an example. Uh, which means we don't even need to, uh, you don't need an API from us to do that. So there, there's um, the ability to just connect to uh, the geospatial server uh, directly. Um, so the world server technology can run in the cloud. Uh, it can run on a local area network, or it can even run on a single offline PC. So we're, we're well, often when we describe the technology, we're talking about this big server system that can live in the cloud. Uh, but the entire world server system can run on a laptop uh, using data that's on your laptop and serve a VBS4 or another runtime client that's also on the laptop. It can be completely disconnected and still do all the things that it needs to do. Um, so it's scalable in that sense. Um, it has a powerful procedural engine, uh, and it's supported by a, a, an extensive content library with hundreds of high fidelity tree models that we're going to take uh, a look at how that helps build out our, our uh, current uh, world in VBS4. Uh, it provides efficient multi-user data access. So, so users, VBS4 clients that are connected can stream data from the world server. Uh, and that actually also includes editing. So the users that are connected for streaming data from the world server uh, to, their, to their clients can also uh, send changes back. And those changes that come back need to be versioned. Uh, and so we offer a system for versioning of both source data. So if you're, if you're someone responsible for building up the source data on your version of a, or your copy of a world server, um, there's a way to version that data, so um, yeah, you can just manage uh, how that data gets put together. And then user edits that are coming in from clients that are connected who may be using VBS4's geo capability to, to modify the terrain, uh, delete trees, and add, add forests, and, and other things like that, can also be stored at another level within the world server uh, so that you have an authoritative picture of or an authoritative copy of uh, global data, and then user edits that are uh, sitting on top of that. Um, so it's optimized for runtime performance, and it's also designed to be extended um, by open standards and plugin development. So, so the current set of plugins that exist for the world server are things that we needed to develop in order to support our first application, which is VBS4. Um, but as we've mentioned a few times, the, the world server technology is agnostic to any run, particular runtime. Uh, so it can be extended to support other, other systems, other simulations. And in fact, we've been awarded an epic mega grant uh, to develop a way to connect the world server to the Unreal Engine. And so that's something we'll, we'll, we'll be working on within the next year. Um, and, and finally, just kind of in summary for this, this entire capability, it's, it provides us the building, bo building blocks for any uh, custom world server application. Uh, so we're building the VBS world server with it. Uh, if you have different needs that have different runtimes, uh, we would be happy to talk to you and, and understand uh, how we can help apply this technology to to, um, to your terrain needs. Um, so here's just a, a quick kind of overview diagram of the of the world server technology. So on the left hand side is uh, sort of external source data coming into the system. Uh, in the center we have the world server and uh, the, the, a fundamental part of that is the VBS Blue Data plugin system. 
Uh, that's a complicated part of it, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit to explain what it actually does. Um, but that's backed up by the, the curated global data on the geo server, uh, which you can see just below the, the plugin system. So that's a, a geo database uh, storing all of our, our uh, source data that we've curated to, to build our, our version of the world. Uh, and then beside that is the optimized cache that provides our streaming capability to clients like VBS4 and VBS Blue IG. So now if you, if you look to the top right, uh, you can see some examples of uh, consumers of data from the world server, um, starting with VBS4, uh, which can stream data from the world server. And you notice an edit arrow going back into the world server. So um, I think what's important about VBS4 is it has this, um, this VBS geo editing capability where users, <clears throat> when they're connected to the world server, can can modify the version of uh, can modify the the train that they're looking at, so they can uh, go in in 3D, modify roads, add features, remove features, and basically customize the that part of the world to their liking for whichever particular training uh, objectives they're they're trying to accomplish. And those, as I mentioned before, those edits that come back to the world server get stored in a in a separate way to the baseline data, so there's separation between the authoritative view of the world and the edited results that can be um, available to, to missions. Um, I think it's important also to mention here, though, that those, those edits that come back are still uh, treated as terrain data. So they're, they're just as efficient and just as functional when, once they're streamed back out to clients um, as the core terrain data is. And this is a difference uh, with VBS4, an improvement over VBS3, where you could use the mission editor editor to place a lot of trees and buildings, but at some point it would start to slow down because uh, all of those dynamic entities weren't really part of the efficient uh, terrain format. In the case of VBS Geo, when you're editing terrain, you're, you're really truly editing the terrain layer and it's just being stored in a separate uh, compartment from, from the baseline data. Um, so yeah, moving down the list a little bit. So VBS Blue IG uh, streams data from the world server in a very similar way to VBS4. Uh, and then the next one is uh, Cesium. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with that, but it's, it's a framework for rendering 3D data, uh, 3D scenes within a web browser. Uh, and it uses open geospatial uh, standards to do that, like the WMS format I, I mentioned before. So that's going to, uh, we're in the process of just building that now. And it's going to allow us to actually look at data on the world server in 3D to see what we have there. So without having to launch VBS or uh, any heavy application, you can just use a web browser, uh, connect to the world server from, uh, from any system, and be able to take a look at the data that you have in, in 3D. And, and so we can see that becoming part of the, the management system that someone would use to, to actually manage data and versions on, on the world server. Uh, and finally, for other runtime formats at the bottom, uh, we're currently looking at uh, other formats we're, we're going to support. I mentioned the uh, Unreal use case. Um, and over time, we expect to support many more uh, formats from this, this general world server capability that we have. Um, OK, and then moving down, just, just finally, the, um, the sorry, my interface is getting in the way here. The block at the bottom is TerraTools. So currently, as, as Pete mentioned, uh, TerraTools is our advanced terrain generation system. Uh, that's currently able to connect to the world server um, and read data from the global data set, uh, generate terrains, and then publish those terrains back to the world server for consumption in, in VBS4 or VBS Blue IG. Um, the, what Pete talked about is in, in the longer term, we can envision a, a, a version of the world server that actually includes TerraTools as part of it. So instead of having an engineer sitting at a desk running TerraTools and then sending files up to the world server for uh, training systems, uh, TerraTools could actually be part of the world server. Uh, and we could massively simplify the way that people actually interact with TerraTools to, to, uh, to just be able to generate train uh, much more rapidly than we, than we can today. Um, and actually, just, just to sort of show an example of how the world server is really agnostic and isn't necessarily connected to VBS4, in the next slide, I'm going to show a, an interface that we built for the US Army for a prototype that actually generated WarSim terrain. Uh, and WarSim war terrain is a, uh, it's a constructive simulation. Um, it, doesn't, it isn't able to stream data. So what we built was a Cesium interface that can connect to the world server. Uh, it, it's a very simplified uh, user interface. The user does not need to know anything about building terrain. They just see the planet. They can select an area that they want to have built, and then they can uh, 
uh, just send out a request to have that terrain generated. And what happens on the back end with the server is it receives that request, passes the geographic area to TerraTools, which goes off and collects the data from that uh, global data set. Uh, and then it's able to build that Warson terrain off, uh, sorry, online on the server. And when it's done, it'll send uh, an email to the user uh, with a download link showing them that their terrain is complete. Uh, and so uh, VBS isn't part of that at all. It's just uh, an implementation, a prototype of the world server doing uh, something something other than VBS with uh, uh, the inclusion of, of Terra tools in that process as well. Um, so coming back to the VBS world server now, which is the product that we're about to, to release with, with VBS4. Um, so this is the first real productized application of world server technology. Um, and the VBS world server is designed to support VBS4 and VBS Blue IG. So it has uh, a number of the components that we just looked at in that, in that world server um, diagram. So it has the curated global data set uh, for a, a complete representation of the whole planet, all of the buildings and roads that we uh, have been able to collect for a planetary database. Uh, it also includes all the procedural enhancement techniques that we're about to uh, show some demonstrations of. Uh, and it also supports dynamic terrain changes um, for things like craters and explosions and things that happen uh, within a mission can be stored on the, on the world server and propagated out to all the connected clients. OK, so just to review this again, this is the, the same diagram we just looked at. Um, I just wanted to kind of explain a little bit more about the, the VBS Blue data plugin system. It's a really important part of the world server. Uh, it's a complicated part as well. So that's the central blue box in the middle of the world server there. And as I move to the next slide, you're going to see what that actually uh, looks like from a configuration point of view. So it's this uh, pretty complicated network of, of pieces. Uh, it's a, it's a graph-based system, and it defines the entire data flow for terrain from source data to the client. And it provides all of the capabilities that we've just talked about in terms of procedurally enhancing terrain, uh, you know, providing efficient runtime streaming, um, so, so the graph itself is is actually passive, and it waits it waits for uh, real time requests to come in from the viewer. So, in this case, if you could imagine a VBS four client connected, that's on the far right, that block with all of the data inputs coming into it. Um, so that that would be the VBS four client um, requesting terrain data, and what happens is that request will encompass a particular region. That region requests come comes to the data plugin system. Uh, and then off it goes to basically provide data from all the way from source data through this entire plugin chain to provide the, the scene that the viewer is requesting. Um, yeah, so each each of the individual blocks here has a particular function. Uh, and in, in that way, it's it's actually kind of similar to Terra Tools that each plugin has a, a, a role to play that may be some, some form of uh, importing, modifying, or, or merging data. An, an example of modifying data may be uh, a particular plugin may combine uh, road linears and height information. Uh, and anywhere that a road linear crosses uh, a steep slope, um, that plugin may do something like uh, flattening the, the terrain underneath the road so that the end result is uh, a user that has a, a terrain scene with a, a flattened road in it. Go ahead. Yeah, and the key point here is that all of this can happen at runtime. So, uh, you know, there's a similar graph to this into TerraTools, for example, but what's really strong about this implementation is that at runtime, we can do all that processing really, really quickly. Uh, and when you see a VBS4 scene, you know, when the scene loads and the trees come in and the roads dig into the terrain, that's actually this pipeline processing the data really, really quickly at runtime. And I think you're, you're going to dig into the detail now. Um, and yeah, so uh, I guess the last point about how that plugin system, uh, what we're looking at is a single instance here. Uh, the plugin system can actually communicate with other plugin systems, and that's that's fundamentally how the uh, VBS4 client streams data from the uh, VBS world server. So there's two plugin systems, uh, and they communicate uh, between plugins across the network. So we can actually choose how much of the procedural uh, generation happens at, at uh, uh, between server and client. OK, so this is a simplified example of how the plugin system works. Uh, so again, we have the, the client on the far right. If you look at the, the arrow that's there, and imagine that's a, a VBS user that's um, looking at a, a particular area of the world. Uh, that data request comes back through the plugin system. 
and travels all the way back to the, the left side here where we have uh, a base height inset as well as um, some sort of customized height inset that's uh, present on the server. Uh, those two uh, elevation data sets uh, are combined at the, the next node. Um, and then that node provides that combined elevation data to the to the next uh, piece, which is a road influencer. And in this case, just like the example I uh, explained previously, that's where um, we went, the operation here would be uh, road vectors being combined with elevation data to perform things like uh, flattening the road underneath, uh, any, I'm sorry, flattening the elevation data underneath uh, where a road crosses. Um, so that continues down, and, and as Pete mentioned, this can happen on a on a frame rate level. So this may be happening uh, 60 times per second. Uh, every time the user turns the camera, that request is coming back, and, and it's being resolved and, and provided with a, an updated piece of terrain to render in the scene. Um, now, what can also happen is when that user, say, an event happens in the world and an ex there's an explosion, uh, that explosion can be sent to the server as an event. And if you see the uh, crater height uh, plugin here has an API that's listening for events. Uh, so it gets an event that a crater, uh, sorry, an explosion happened and it needs to generate a crater. So it has a way of uh, providing a modified height, uh, a height modifier that represents the crater. That is then combined with the, uh, the baseline data that's coming through this, um, the next node and then provide it back to the viewer. So he then sees the, uh, the crater uh, update in, in real time. And any other viewer who's connected to the world server when that event happens also sees that, that crater get propagated. And that can include clients that are not uh, VBS4. So that if you're looking in Cesium and we're providing a Cesium stream from this, uh, then you would see that same result happen uh, in probably in near real time in the case of a, a Cesium view. view. Okay. Um, so that's, I guess, a quick overview of how the um, the VBS World Server works and, and World Server technology in general and its plugin system. Uh, next, I'm going to be showing a little bit about how the uh, just some examples of how the procedural data improves uh, provides our improved uh, improved view of the world. Yeah. So we're also now going to just bring up some videos um, to show really what is the baseline data that the World Server provides. Uh, and, and just to kind of reiterate, you, you're going to see everything here in VBS, so VBS4 mainly. Uh, but keep in mind that the World Server technology is agnostic, that VBS Blue plugin system is runtime agnostic. And in fact, um, as part of our work with Epic uh, on, under the Mega Grant, we are hoping to investigate connecting that plugin system directly into to Unreal. Because clearly, if you do all of that data generation on the server and then try and stream uh, polygon, uh, poly poly polygonal data across the network is going to be a huge amount of data. So in an ideal world, the server is doing some of the work and the client is doing the rest of the work. Um, and we use the plugin system on both client and server. So we're going to investigate connecting that client side processing into a different engine in the near future. Uh, so we're really excited about this, uh, about this capability, and especially the fact that it is all agnostic. All right, Earl, so, so back to you to, to give us some, uh, some demonstrations of this technology. OK, uh, thanks. So uh, first video I'm going to show is just an example of uh, correlated terrain. So this is our ability to uh, provide uh, correlated terrain to multiple multiple formats. So first, we're looking at uh, VBS4. And I'm just going to pause it here for a second while we kind of discuss this. So this is an area of uh, Colorado. It's actually the, the town of Telluride in Colorado. Um, and this, um, this terrain was built uh, using TerraTools in this case. Uh, but it's being served from the world server. So this is, in this case, someone built this terrain with TerraTools, uploaded it to the world server, and it's being served to a VBS4 client across the network that way. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly simple terrain. Uh, it's just a, an example terrain that we're using to test uh, some of our correlation work. And in the next section, we're going to take a look at how we've been able to reproduce this terrain in a number of different different systems. Uh, so here we're looking at Unreal. Uh, and again, this is the same terrain. Uh, the one difference here is uh, as it's a work in progress, uh, we're not seeing the, uh, the tree points here. But uh, the rest of the scene is, is created uh, exactly as seen in VBS4 uh, and, and from a geometry point of view is, is fully correlated. 
Uh, and then we have the same train again in Unity. Um, so this is, uh, again, this is just a correlated train in Unity. It looks a little different. I think there's just something that needs to be adjusted with the lighting set settings. I'm, I'm not a Unity expert, so um, just minor, minor changes we'll need to address. Uh, but again, from a ge geometry point of view, it's a perfectly correlated terrain. Uh, and now in this case, we're actually looking at cesium. Uh, and what's interesting about this is I'm just connected via a web browser, and I'm actually connected to a, a world server instance, and it's providing this uh, 3, 3D view of the same train that we've just looked at. Um, so in, we're just starting this development. Um, this is actually showing uh, our, our first um, development into 3D tiles, which is the format that, that cesium uses. Um, it's a it's a new model format that is being standardized, and in fact, is the model format that's being used by the U.S. Army's uh, One World Terrain System. Okay, and then finally, this is uh, a look at just a WMS feed. So I've mentioned this a few times. This is how cesium gets uh, information like uh, photo texture and other things to to present on the, the cesium view of the terrain. This is a, a fully uh, open standard way of sharing ge geospatial data across the network. Uh, and in this case, again, I just have a web browser that's connected to the uh, to our world server, uh, and it's providing this uh, geographic data feed that uh, is very easy to connect to a number of different kinds of clients. OK, so that's the uh, correlation demonstration. I'm going to move now to uh, a look at biomes. And this is, we're going to take sort of a, a deeper dive into uh, something that we don't uh, show that often, which is how we've actually generated the trees that you see in VBS4 and in the biome. So um, this is an internal capability we have for uh, generating pr trees procedurally, uh, trees and, and vegetation. So we'll take a look at that. And then we're going to look at some, uh, some of the locations that are using these plants within uh, VBS4. Uh, so this is a fully procedural system, and I think just in a second you'll see it actually regenerate from uh, the, sort of its base level, and you can see the branches and leaves growing out in detail, and then some shading operations happening. So this is the underlying model that we use to generate all the vegetation that appears in our in our procedural uh, biome system. Uh, what this allows us to do is generate as as high resolution version of the plant as you could possibly need. Um, and then the system also creates all of the LODs as well as the, um, the sort of, well, the LODs, but also the, uh, the lowest LOD that allows us to generate uh, massive scenes using these models. So as, complica as complicated as these models appear to be in the system, uh, it also provides for highly efficient ways of presenting these in a runtime context. So here you can see our, our dandelion example. Uh, it's a particularly detailed model. Uh, and if you look closely in the grass and in VBS, you will see this model presented there. Uh, so you can just see quickly how it is actually grown from basically from its root all the way up to the top of the plant. Uh, and in this case, uh, we can also modify those with, again, with some procedural rule changes to show different results on the plant. And this is also how we're able to build uh, seasonal variants for each of these trees. Uh, right. So then I think we can jump into the a demonstration. So we're starting with a, a location uh, in England. I believe this is actually Sherwood Forest, so it's a uh, pine forest, and you'll see a mix of uh, weeds on the ground and uh, shrubs and, and pine trees, a mix at a, a pretty realistic density. So um, the, the the way the, uh, the tree models are optimized really allows us to place uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of, of trees in any given scene at one time and, and really have a, a realistic level of density. Uh, so now we're moving to uh, to Crete, and we're going to see a uh, an example of uh, a more arid area that has a very different looking uh, biome set. And just to provide a bit of context here, so the world server in this example has all of the data for where the forests are and what the biomes are, and you know the procedural generation of actually placing down the trees in the correct locations can either happen on the world server or in VBS4 through the plugin system. So I just want to give you that context. So even though we're looking at this specifically in VBS4, this fantastic vegetation content placed really realistically, other rendering engines could leverage the same technology. 
OK, so now we're into a uh, savanna location in Africa, showing, again, uh, a variety of different uh, vegetation models that have been produced and can be placed uh, at a massive scale across, across the landscape. Um, now I think it jumps to uh, a location in mountains in Iran. Uh, and you can see sort of a low shrub uh, biome being being placed here on the mountains. Uh, and if you look in Google Maps, it really does look very, very similar. So uh, you can imagine that when, uh, if, if you're going to build a new terrain, uh, you no longer have to worry about getting necessarily elevation data, imagery, um, and some of the other kinds of data sets that you might sometimes need to build a terrain from scratch. Uh, now, if you know if this type of terrain is is uh, it can already be useful, and you may just need to use Geo to add a few buildings and, and some other details that you need for your, your training solution. Uh, so it massively simplifies the effort of actually building out a large terrain. And as you can see, it's it's rendered as far as the eye can see, so there's no more uh, you know, edges of the terrain that you need to worry about. Uh, so now we're going down to an area in Australia. Uh, and here we're going to see the difference with uh, all the eucalyptus trees. Um, and I think it's interesting to, to sort of point out that this, the biome system is configurable. So uh, Australia had uh, some horrible wild, wildfires a few years ago. Um, we would be able to represent those if we have the, the, the geographic data representing the burned areas. We could repre represent those as well and, and include them in, in the biome system. Uh, so this is an area in New Zealand now. And again, we're seeing uh, regionally specific and, and correct vegetation uh, populated at a, a really high density. Um, and uh, I think there's a few more locations we're going to visit. Right. So I think next we're moving to, uh, actually, I need to see the video, uh, Russia, the Far East Russia, so Kamchatka. So this is um, a uh, sort of a, a tundra bog type area. And again, so basically anywhere you can go in the world in, in VBS4 right now uh, has a very complete picture of uh, the, the natural landscape. And in, in the next video, I'm going to show how we've done some of the uh, buildings and roads as well. So we're, we're also doing cities in the same way. OK, I'm just going to advance the speed on this a little bit. Okay, so uh, almost final location. So this is uh, should be Joshua Tree National Park, uh, and you can see again just regionally specific vegetation. Uh, it has the correct types of of plants uh, growing here. And uh, last but not least, I think we visit a location in Argentina. So again, you can see here uh, we're moving into an area that's uh, plains in the foothills of the mountains, and you know just by itself, this is a, a completely realistic scene uh, for this part of the world, and uh, it's essentially it could already be a complete uh, training terrain for you. So you don't need, may not even need to build any terrain at all. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move now. So we've shown sort of the, the natural world and, and how we're representing that with the procedural system. And Pete, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. So, so look, just just while this is playing in the background, so you know everything that you're seeing uh, on screen is effectively the base terrain layer that, that ships with the, the VBS World Server, the productized variant of the World Server, could also be leveraged, uh, you know, in other instantiations of the World Server as well. So, you know, what we, we obviously looked at the forestry data that is rendering uh, or, or informing the system where to put the trees, we're seeing roads from OpenStreetMap. In this video, we can see buildings from OpenStreetMap, waterways, uh, rivers, uh, creeks is all there. Obviously, height field uh, data is there as well. This is the base terrain layer that effectively can be shipped with the world server, um, again, just to provide that context. Uh, and so, Earl, I guess uh, back to you um, to, to talk about these buildings a little bit. OK, yeah, so we're, we're just moving through a few sample cities just to, sh to show the extent of the uh, the global building generation that has happened. Um, so uh, this is New York City, uh, probably one of the more challenging places we can build. And you can see uh, it has uh, just about every building represented. Um, and where available, we have all the correct heights and, and all that information. And over time, we're actually trying to improve that uh, data set that we're using to build this. So um, it, it's a very complete 
view of the world right now, and and uh, there's still some some improvements that uh, we can continue to make. Um, Right, so at this point, I'm gonna to move to a more specific example where we're gonna jump in and show a little bit about uh, VBS Geo editing. Uh, so I'm gonna hold this for a second. So uh, we're in VBS4, this is uh, VBS Geo that I'm going to be using. Um, this is showing an example of using the, the baseline terrain that comes with the VBS world server. Uh, so I haven't had to do any uh, standard terrain editing. I've just placed some objects in the world where they're actually correctly located. Uh, and in this case, I have two um, uh, I have two uh, buildings that were uh, scanned with a, a LiDAR base station scanner and were converted into a, a 3D model. So these are really high resolution, highly detailed uh, building models. Um, and what I'm doing now is using the VBS Geo editing capability to just add some details to make the scene a little more interesting. And I'm going to just increase the playback speed so we can move through this. So you can see here, I'm using the road tool to place uh, a road. And as soon as I'm done tracing this line, you'll see the, the, the actual road, uh, the road surface appear where I've, where I've placed it. Uh, and then I'm gonna move to the uh, sort of single object placing tool. So uh, selecting from this huge library of vegetation. Uh, these are the same plant models that you've seen in all of the biomes. It's, it's exactly the same plant models. Um, and I can place them individually using Geo. So this is how, if you if your biome uh, isn't as complete as you might like, or or you just want to add some extra detail to the scene, uh, this is a really quick uh, and easy way to do it, um, and can just improve the uh, you know a particular site of interest that you're using for training. Uh, and again, these changes that I'm making in Geo can be saved to the world server, and any other client that's connected can see those changes. But they're stored in a way that doesn't become part of the global baseline unless we want it to. Um, at the current point in the in the 20.1 release, these are going to be stored inside uh, a battle space, which is a uh, um, it's a way of storing data that's related just to a particular mission or a uh, a particular training event. Uh, so after I finish placing some vegetation, uh, I then switch to uh, placing some other other objects. I'm just going to skip ahead slightly because there's a little bit of a delay in. Uh, how this video runs. And one of the really interesting things about this data is that you brought these models in from external sources, right, Earl? This is not 3D, or VBS3 content. This is some kind of LiDAR scan of these historic buildings in Spain. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. So the yeah, the, the building models themselves are were external data that uh, were brought in uh, as an external model and, and converted to, to run in VBS4. Roger. And I mean, if anyone's interested in how that works, we've refactored the way you bring 3D content into uh, VBS4. And we actually did that on day three of the tech conference, which I've linked to in the uh, in the chat, uh, if you want to see how easy that is now. It's about twice as fast to do that in VBS4 as it was in VBS3. OK, and now you can see what I'm doing here is actually editing the, the surface. So uh, the tall grass was uh, interfering with the, the buildings that I had just quickly placed there. Uh, and it's very easy to just use Geo to uh, to change that. Um, we do also have the capability in, in Geo for uh, buildings that get placed uh, to simply actually modify the terrain under them. So uh, modifying the terrain or the, uh, the the surface that's present based on a model that you place is something that uh, can also be done. Um, right, so we're about to switch from uh, sort of model placement. I think quickly I'm going to place some uh, some fence objects as well, which is showing the linear placement tool in Geo. Uh, so now instead of placing individual objects, we, we do have these individual fences that uh, if you were to drive into them in during simulation mode, you can knock down individual pieces. Uh, but we have this linear placement tool that makes it very uh, quick and easy to place uh, uh, segmented objects. So that could be fences or uh, lines of trees, lines of power lines. Um, Anything that you need to place in a, in a linear array is now uh, far easier to do uh, using Geo. OK, so this is now uh, uh, good enough for the, the test that I'm running here. And so I'm going to end up placing, I'm, I move now to the editor, the mission editor, which if you're familiar with VBS3, you should be, I guess, familiar with uh, how this works. Uh, but this lets me place entities uh, on the train and then take control of them and, and actually run a, a mission. So 
so at this point, I'm now going to uh, move around and actually look inside these buildings because the way these buildings were produced with uh, uh, what appears to be a, 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 a LiDAR system uh, for, for scanning uh, 3D models, we've actually have full interiors here. So I'm able to actually move inside the building and see really high resolution interiors. And you can see this, the scan itself isn't fully complete. Uh, that's just the way the model uh, came in. That was part of the, the original scan. Um, those sorts of things can, can certainly be corrected. And then uh, mod the model can be modified using the, the process that, or the tools that, that Pete referenced. Um, that's going to make uh, uh, model development much easier in VBS4 compared to VBS3. Okay, now I think we move into the into the second building and uh, look at the interiors in here, um, and just showing an example of how the um, you know all the detail of this building is really really coming through, including uh, holes in the roof and everything that was part of the scan. Uh, we're able to just simply import that directly, and it sort of interacts correctly with the with the world. Okay, and then we move around the building and we're just gonna look at that site that I uh, improved slightly with, uh, with Geo. So just adding some, uh, uh, some, some detail to the scene, uh, that all looks correct. And now I'm going to move to the front. And I saw someone asking questions about uh, underground support. Um, so I think uh, that's what we're about to show. So the interesting thing about this data set and the reason that I imported it as a, as a test is it actually has an underground tunnel uh, that goes underneath the road from one building to another. This is actually a, a historical site in Spain that was part of the, uh, I think it was significant during the, the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and that's why uh, I think a museum scanned it uh, and provided the model online. Uh, and you can see here, we're going to actually use this uh, stairway down underground. Uh, and I think if you're familiar with VBS3 and the way the underground system worked, uh, the interesting thing about it is we can place we can place those models anywhere as long as they have the, I guess the markings that explain that they're uh, part of, or they have an underground uh, component to them. And v, the VBS4 will take care of cutting the terrain wherever you place that model. So I didn't have to do anything to make this underground system uh, work uh, in terms of uh, manipulating the terrain. It's all within the model itself. And you can just place the model on the terrain and it, it cuts the terrain as you, as you place it. Okay, so that's uh, the end of that video. Hopefully that uh, gave you a little bit of a, a preview of how um, uh, VBS Geo works. And now I'm gonna move to a final example here of just another another train that we've built. So this is, um, I'm just gonna adjust the speed here. So this is actually uh, Oktoberfest in Munich. Uh, this was this data set was pro provided to us by uh, a company in Munich called Quantum Systems. I think their website is quantum-systems.com. They actually produce drones, uh, and we were working with them on uh, being able to use their scan data in in VBS, as you can see here. So they actually provided us just the the, the photography from a, an overflight. And we took all of those photos and we ran it through a, a third party photogrammetry process, which takes the photos and generates this 3D mesh that you're looking at. Um, and in addition to that, we were able to also take uh, the point cloud that that process generates. And, uh, and then we were able to um, give the train a little bit of semantics that allow AI to navigate through it. So what I'm doing now is placing some individual soldiers uh, and giving them uh, a group and then giving the leader of that group uh, a waypoint to move through the space uh, in a way that's going to cross some of these obstacles. And you'll see they'll actually uh, move around the obstacles quickly. So you, so this uh, was really, there's a little bit of work to, to develop this process, but now that we've, we have this process, it would be uh, quick to generate again. So this you'll see this as a, a capability that our tools can offer now uh, um, for being able to, to quickly import a drone type uh, scans like this and use them in a, in a simulation context. Okay, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. You've seen the move through there, uh, just to show one more example uh, of using this, this uh, scan data as a, uh, in simulation. So now you can see that a car is driving on, on the surface. Um, and from this altitude, even though the, the scan itself isn't, isn't greatly detailed up close, uh, it may not work for a ground-based uh, training system uh, 
because the the quality of the model up close when you're on the ground isn't that great. But from up here, if you're looking uh, to develop a, a UAV simulation or something like that, it could be uh, entirely useful and is uh, potentially very quick to build terrain like this. Okay, so that's the end of this video. Um, I have one more that I'm gonna show quickly, which uh, just shows a little bit about um, how we can handle uh, underwater scenes, so bathymetry, uh, which is the term for underwater elevation data. Uh, in this case, it's a very high resolution uh, image set paired with a high resolution um, elevation, elevation data that includes uh, the underwater surfaces. Uh, so this is uh, US government data from NOAA that has, I think it's three to 10 meter resolution uh, bathymetry. So the, the sea floor basically is mapped out in great detail. Uh, and here we've just shown how we can make a, a very realistic underwater scene. Okay, and I think the other thing to, to note from, from this terrain sample here is uh, we're actually not using the, uh, the biome system here. So we're not using procedural vegetation. And I just wanted to show this because uh, there are some cases where you may not want that. Uh, you may wanna use just traditional high resolution data and, and high resolution elevation uh, with no procedural data being uh, involved and that's uh, easily possible. So, so it's, it's really up to the user for how they wanna build their terrain and how much of the procedural system they wanna leverage, whether that's, uh, the biome forests, uh, procedural cutting of roads into, into elevation data, all of that can be configured. Uh, and this is just a quick look at how uh, detailed the bathymetric data is. So we have a really uh, high accuracy representation of the seafloor. Uh, so if you're doing uh, uh, subsurface operations, uh, you know, our world server and in this case, VBS4 can help you with that. Okay. Uh, so that's the end of the sort of video tours. Um, I have, uh, oops, sorry, I'm just going to roll back to the, the presentation quickly. And um, so I hope that this was kind of useful in, in, in understanding how our world server technology enables all of these uh, features to work. Um, if you have any well, actually, I'm going to pass over to Pete to, to help wrap this up. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks, all. That was an awesome demo. So uh, just, to, just to kind of reiterate what we all just saw, um, we, we gave a presentation initially talking about the products that we are offering related to terrain. Uh, and in fact, Earl, if it's possible just to go back to that slide, I think it's, it's good to just do a, a summary um, of that. It'll just take, uh, it'll just take 30 seconds. Yep. Sorry, which slide? Uh, the product slide. Yep, I think slide three or four or something. Here yeah, this is it. So yeah, so so um, just just to kind of just recap what we all just saw. So so we've got products that are available now. So VBS four, uh, which includes VBS Geo. We saw Earl give a demonstration of VBS Geo there. Very quick and easy to modify the terrain, uh, and the modified terrain can then be stored on the world server. Now there's some nuance there uh, in the in the current version of VBS four. You can't bake those modifications into the base terrain, but by the end of the year, you'll be able to do that. Um, we, we looked at the VBS World Server, which is a productized version of the World Server technology. And what Earl did was give you some examples of terrain that was being streamed from the VBS World Server down into VBS4. And again, I'll remind you all that uh, we're doing this in a runtime agnostic way. Even though you were seeing everything there in, in VBS4, if you had the same uh, terrain content, uh, vegetation content, and different engine, uh, you would get the same procedural rule sets from the World Server, and you'd be able to place uh, exactly correlated uh, objects and, and, and terrain down in a different engine. Uh, and then the customized world server capability, the idea that we could turn this into an enterprise terrain solution, um, completely unrelated to VBS. I mean, I'm hoping that our customers love VBS and want to use it, but you know, if, if that's not the case, uh, there is probably still a solution there in the world server uh, for you. Uh, and then we're working on enhancing all of this in the very near future. Uh, world server or cloud enabling, enabling terror tools, uh, building support for addition, additional formats uh, and features, uh, as well as a terrain SDK. Um, so that was awesome. And now I'll remind you all before we get to questions that tomorrow we're gonna do a bit more of a deep dive. Um, so Earl, do you wanna just talk about the agenda specifically for tomorrow? You're on mute, mate. 
sorry. So, so tomorrow we're going to be taking a look actually at um, how we're actually using the various terrain tools to produce terrain for VBS4. So when when VBS20 VBS420.1 is released, how are you going to build terrain for it? Uh, and especially we're going to take a look at trying to answer when you should use Terra tools, uh, when you should use Geo, and how they can actually combine for a really powerful terrain editing system. Um, and in addition, we're going to have some partners there. So um, both Lux Carta and Vrycon will be here uh, with us talking about the, their terrain data products and how those can work uh, with our world server and VBS4 and other runtimes. And this is just a really quick uh, sample of uh, what their data has helped us build. So right here, we're flying over uh, Wonsan in North Korea uh, with data that was provided by Lux Carta. We'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow. Um, and I also, there's a quick preview of uh, some Vrycon 3D data that was imported over Pyongyang in North Korea. So two different approaches to terrain that have uh, different benefits, uh, and we're going to dig into that a lot more tomorrow. Awesome. Okay, so I think we're just going to push through now and answer some questions in the, in the five minutes we have left. If we don't get to your question, we will do our best to follow up via, uh, via email. Um, so I'm going to take the first one. Uh, which is related to One World Terrain, um, you know, part of, of STI. Uh, the short answer is uh, yes, we're planning on doing a, a fairly tight One World Terrain integration. Uh, Vrycon is the provider of One World Terrain data into the STI. Uh, you literally just saw some Vrycon data in VBS, so we'll talk more to that uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's a question here about demonstration software. Uh, if you would like to acquire demonstration software, VBS uh, 4, for example, VBS Blue IG, the VBS World Server, please just send us an email. Um, we'll reach out to the specific person who asked us here in the chat. We offer, offer trial licenses, uh, of course. And just in, in case it wasn't clear, the VBS World Server is included with VBS 4. It's not an extra cost. Um, and it's optional. If you want to use VBS 4 the same way you use VBS 3 and you just load your terrain locally, you can do that. Um, but VBS World Server will help you in, in big deployments in battle simulation centers uh, and the like. Um, there's a question here that uh, I, I think I'll hand over to you, Earl. You did address this when you were speaking about War Sim Terrain. My understanding is that was very much, uh, it wasn't a live connection. You would just select and download the terrain that you were interested in. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, so um, <clears throat> the VBS World Server will come with the optimized data that's uh, supporting VBS4 and VBS Blue IG. It won't have the entire uh, uh, global data set in, in raw form as part of the, the v VBS um, World Server release. Uh, but the World Server technology does support that. And if uh, we will have a TerraTools enabled version, uh, I'm sorry, TerraTools will be able to connect to that World Server data and it would be able to export it to one staff. And that is exactly what you saw in that in that Warsim terrain exporter. Understood. Thank you. Uh, next one is for you. OK, so in VBS4 and TerraTools, can I add charts so that uh, can view paper maps in the C2 RTE? Uh, so Pete, I might need some help on this in terms of where the, the map tool is. But I do know <laughs> that, <laughs> no, no, that, so that. So I know that we've, we've actually developed a, a map, cap, a, a C2 map capability that is external to BBS for uh, exactly where it ends up in the in the product lineup. I'm a little bit less clear, but we can uh, we can support uh, charts from third party data or even streaming from from the world server now. Yeah, exactly. And there's a couple of ways to do it as far as I'm aware. Um, so. There's a, an ability to import and overlay into the VBS chalkboard slash VBS plan capability. Uh, in VBS4, we have an external map capability that uh, is being ported to VBS4 right now. It'll be in uh, the 20.2 release at the end of the year. So there are, is a couple of ways to do what you're asking. Uh, we will probably need to help you, at least in the very first version of VBS4, because we're still finalizing uh, kind of the easy import of you know, raster overlays uh, to be viewed in the 2D map in, in VBS4. All right. Uh, so this one I'm, I'm going to tackle. Um, what is the minimum bandwidth required for the world server? Can terrain be downloaded to a laptop? We're still actually figuring out bandwidth requirements, uh, to be honest with you. Um, the bandwidth requirement is relatively low uh, because we're not streaming the polygonal data across the network. We're streaming instructions that VBS4 then takes. OK, I need to place trees in this area. Uh, so for example, we are connected to our various uh, BISM offices and uh, pulling world server data down to our local 
computers all the time. You know, I can connect to our Prague office and pull down data. Um, there is like a, a noticeable wait time, obviously, but it's it's you know it's in the tens of seconds, not minutes. Uh, and then once I've got that download data download, it, it is cached locally. So unless the data gets updated on the server, uh, I don't have to do a refresh of my cache and I can just load, keep, keep working with that with that data, um, which is which is working pretty well. And it is possible to uh, effectively link multiple VBS world server instances. This is not something that um, I think we've documented yet, but you can have a world server that is, has a cache connected to another world server, um, you know, to remote from a battle simulation center, for uh, for example. And yes, you can uh, save the data and, and use it offline. The VBS world server can, does not need connection to an internet, to the internet, and a VBS, for instance, does not need a connection to a world server. Uh, so if you don't want to use it, you don't you don't need to. Uh, okay, yeah. So there's a question here about VBS Geo versus TerraTools and when to use which tool. Now, I gave a high level description of that, and and I'll leave that for tomorrow because you know because I want you to come back. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that tomorrow during uh, during the deep dive. Yeah. Um, there's a question uh, about frame rates and pre-caching. Um, we're going to follow up with you separately uh, on that specific question because it's complex and um, neither Earl nor I can answer it. There are various ways that you can uh, assess the performance of your uh, of your terrain, uh, but we'll, we'll tackle that that separately. Um, there's a question here about VBS content being the same content in other runtimes. So, you know, you do need to make sure that the same 3D content is available in the different engine, for example, in the Unreal engine. But, you know, if you have the same FBX model loaded in VBS and loaded in Unreal, uh, and the world server you know, will basically be telling uh, the, the two engines to render the same tree in the same location. Uh, but you do need the same 3D content, obviously. Uh, and, I would add that uh, I should have said it earlier that you can import VBS3 terrain directly into VBS4 as well. Uh, we're going to have a, a separate tutorial video on that in the next couple of weeks showing how you can do that. And you literally have your VBS3 terrain represented as an inset within your VBS4 base globe. Um, so that's, that's a pretty cool feature. You can reuse everything you get in, in VBS3. Um, some questions about the YouTube channel, which I've now posted directly into the chat. Uh, here's a good question for you, Earl, about the length of time it takes to generate that uh, that terrain you show. You're on mute again, man. Thank you. It was. Um, uh, I'd have to go back and measure it exactly, but it was a matter of minutes. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't even ten minutes. Uh, and that was, uh, I think, a seven by seven kilometer terrain with uh, one meter resolution imagery and I think ten meter resolution uh, height map data. There's a question here about the biome system, and you know the, the, the answer is it's a little complex. So if you want to modify the biomes, if you wanted to add your own 3D content to the biomes, you would need to talk to us about that. I don't think we have time to document that in the first release of VBS4 or the first VBS World Server. So if you're really dying to add a you know new biome or change the biome, reduce tree density perhaps, then um, please contact us and we can help you help you do that. Effectively, the biomes are defined in XML files um, that are well, I wouldn't call them human readable, but um, you know relatively straightforward. Uh, so there's a question here about underground tunnels or buildings, and yes, we support underground tunnels and underground buildings in the same way we did in VBS3. That's what Earl actually just showed, uh, effectively through ground cutting. The terrain representation is a grid, uh, and there's lots of good reasons why we did it that way. Um, it's a fairly dynamic grid. You can go down to millimeter resolution, uh, but this does mean that you can't, for example, drill a hole through a mountain uh, in the terrain representation, you need to place 3D content that cuts through that terrain. And we're doing this already procedurally with tunnels. Uh, that's not in the VBS4 release, but it should be in there by the end of the year. Um, you place down a, a model that should cut through the terrain and it will cut through the terrain and you can use that in, in simulation. Uh, a question about the title of today's recording. Um, I don't know, uh, probably VBS Tech Conference terrain or something. Um, I'm intending to upload that to YouTube tonight. It'll just be one of the new YouTube videos on our channel. Uh, a good question here about how we're related to Bohemia Interactive, the game studio. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, they make 
games. We make military training simulations. We occasionally share technology, um, but these days we basically run our own software baseline. So I would say that we are friends with Bohemia Interactive Studios uh, and I'm an avid gamer, so I play a lot of their games. Um, but really these days we're working on technology specific to government and military. Uh, a question here about bringing models into VBS4. Um, I recommend you look at the day three VBS4 tech conference video. It's in that playlist that I linked earlier. Uh, Julian goes into great detail about how we do that in VBS4. It is very different and much easier than in VBS3. You no longer require the oxygen uh, proprietary tool that you did in VBS3 to bring 3D content into uh, VBS4. Uh, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, somebody said the brief was very informative, so thank you. Well done, Earl. Uh, here's a good question about the VBS World Server using the AWS backend. So uh, in the, the VBS4 version, sorry, the VBS World Server that is shipped with VBS4, it is a Windows um, service, essentially. So you install it on a computer, on the local area network, uh, and then you specify the IP when you launch VBS4 to connect to the world server. Um, we do have a containerized version of the VBS world server. We just haven't uh, released it. Uh, we don't intend to release that in, uh, in the short term just because most of the demand right now is for a world server running on the local area network. So if you want to host the VBS world server or that enterprise world server that I was speaking about on AWS, Azure, or any other cloud, uh, system, we can, we can help you do that, but it's not a technology or a capability that's currently in the, in, in, in the current release. Uh, so is VBS4 or the world server um, available to start using it? Um, and, and the answer is that yes, the August release, uh, August 17th is the exact date we plan to release VBS4. It's a ready for training release. It completely replaces VBS3. Uh, by that, I mean it includes all the VBS3 capability and everything you've seen. The baseline whole earth terrain, uh, the VBS world server if you want to use it, uh, and we can arrange a trial license uh, as well. Uh, there's a couple more questions, just three more here. Uh, can you import 3D Studio Max files? Yes. And if you see that video that I referenced earlier, um, and Julian speaks about how to do that using the new model exchanger tool, which will be shipped with VBS4. Does TerraTools support multi-map technology similar to Visitor 4? Do you want to tackle that? It's a VBS3 related question because multi-map, I guess, is no longer relevant in VBS4. Uh, right, yeah. So, so actually, uh, uh, TerraTools has a really powerful multi-map a VBS3 export system that uh, makes multi-maps very, very simple. Uh, it's much, much easier than VBS4. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the US Marine Corps just upgraded from Visitor 4 users to, to uh, TerraTools, and we're developing a uh, basically a set of instructions to explain uh, how to move from Visitor 4 to, uh, to TerraTools uh, for things like to, to show how, how much more easy it is to generate multi-maps, but also other things that Visitor 4 couldn't do, like uh, marking airfields for uh, AI to land and and uh, a lot of similar features. So we're actually planning to have a, a nice uh, tutorial document as a result of that. Awesome. And the very last question before we wrap up, does VBS Blue IG support biotopes, for example, snow? So uh, VBS4 and VBS Blue IG use the exact same VBS Blue rendering engine. And the answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, in the 20.1 release, uh, if you uh, uh, go to Poland and you change the, the time of year, we'll automatically change the, bio, the biome uh, to suit. So for example, we'll automatically make the, the leaves of the trees more orange if it's autumn. Uh, if it's winter, you'll see snowy terrain with uh, leaves removed for trees. So we do support dynamically modifying the biomes based upon time of year. Um, however, we have not yet implemented that for all the biomes on earth. Uh, we do hope to get there. If this is a pressing need, uh, please contact us and we can talk about um, maybe accelerating uh, some of the work for your specific uh, area of the virtual earth. Okay, so um, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your attendance. Please do come back tomorrow for a bit more of a deep dive. Uh, and Earl, thank you very much for a, a great brief. All right, everybody, have a great day. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.